Welcome once again. Right now we're at John chapter 17. Now I know usually I kind of break this up in in bite-sized portions, but I'm going to read this whole chapter and I'm going to put it in all one teaching because it is just such a good thing to, uh, to digest all at once. This is what I call the real Lord's Prayer. I know that a lot of people call some other prayer the Lord's Prayer, and that's fine, but this is the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prayed this. Now, we don't have much of any kind of record of how Jesus prayed himself. You know, we have a a few words here, a few words there, a sentence here, a sentence there. But here we have pretty much a whole chapter of Jesus' prayer, exactly how he prayed. This is awesome. This is exciting. So we can read and we can understand exactly how Jesus prayed. I mean, just between him and the Father. Okay? I know he... The other so-called Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, is how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. But let's look at how Jesus himself actually prayed. This is John chapter 17. Let's start out verse 1. Jesus said these things. Then lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the time has come. I'm going to stop right there because I'm telling you, there's something here we can we can get out of this, even not even a whole verse yet, okay? Jesus, when he prayed, he looked up. He lifted up his eyes. He looked up to heaven, okay? He, he directed his attention heavenward. Now, is it absolutely, you know, essential that everybody looks up when they pray? I, I wouldn't say it's absolutely, you know, mandatory, but hey, This is how our master prayed, okay? This is how he prayed. This is a good example for us to pray as well. He he lifted up his head. He looked up, okay? He didn't close his eyes like a lot of these Christians do today. They close their eyes, they bow their heads. Jesus opened his eyes and lifted up his head, the opposite of what a lot of people do today, okay? Again, am I saying, is it wrong to close your eyes and bow your head? I'm not saying it's wrong, but... Take note here. This is not how Jesus prayed, at least not here. This is not how Jesus prayed. The real Jesus prayer, open your eyes, lift up your head. That's gone. So he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, so he will give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Again, notice this, the way Jesus talks here. He said, glorify your son, that he may glorify you. And he said, you have given him authority over all flesh so that he would give eternal life to all that you give him, to all of those people that you give him. Okay? Okay. That is clearly a sign that there are people that God has chosen to have eternal life and there are people, if you want to call them people, (laughs) that are not chosen to have eternal life. Jesus made a very clear implication here, okay? He didn't say that the Son of Man will give eternal life to everybody on the earth, everybody living. No, He made it very specific. Father, you know, glorify your son that he may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all flesh so that he could give eternal life to those you have given to him, to those you have given to him. Very, very important to understand that it clearly implies here that there are those who are not given to him. This is eternal life that they should know the only true God and to hi- and him whom you sent, Jesus Christ. Here again, what does it mean by to know the only true God and, and Jesus Christ? What does it mean to know him? Okay. Now, today, people, you might say, well, do you know Queen Elizabeth? People would say, oh, yeah, I know Queen Elizabeth. But you don't really know Queen Elizabeth. You can't go knocking on her door. You can't call her. You know, you you can't send her a text, okay? You don't really know her. You can't get too far, okay? 
And that's the same way it goes with God. There are a lot of people that say they know God. Oh, yeah, I know God. Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. But do you really, really know him? Knowing Jesus, knowing God in, in the way that Jesus talks about here is a lot more than just mentally acknowledging historical fact. It's a lot more than just reading about him and believing about him. Okay? Uh, it's about really knowing God as a person. Really, really knowing him. Okay? Like I explained earlier, like, do you really know Queen Elizabeth? Can you knock on her door? Will she open the door and say, hey, come on in. Verse 4, I glorified you on the earth. I have accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. Wow. Jesus existed with the Father before the world existed. Okay? Again, a lot of people, they think that they, that Jesus just came on the scene and that he started this new religion, that he started Christianity. It's not the case at all. He was there. He existed. He was alive. He spoke to men. Adam, Eve, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, David, Isaiah, all of these men knew Jesus. They knew Yeshua. They knew him. They knew the word of God. Now, when Mary conceived, that's when the word of God was incarnated. Okay, But the word of God existed far before the world existed. Jesus didn't start anything new when he came. He made that very clear. Very, very clear. He always existed. And he always will exist. Verse 6, I revealed your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. I revealed your name to the people you have given me out of the world. This is talking about being called out from among them, as the scripture says. This is talking about being holy. God calls you to be holy, which means separated, set apart, consecrated separate from the world, okay? You don't think like the world. You don't live like the world. You don't look like the world. You don't talk like the world. You don't watch the same things the world watch on TV. You don't read the same books the world, the world reads. You don't even play the same secular, very ungodly games that the world plays. You are called out from the world. Okay, so this is what Jesus is talking about. Again, he's talking about a very specific people that God has foreordained. Read this again. Verse 6. I revealed your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. That is being sanctified. That is being holy. That is being set apart. You're set apart out of the world. Okay. Again, it doesn't mean that you come out of the world literally like you live on Mars or something. Okay, That just means that you are not part of the world system. You don't think like they do. You don't live like they do. You don't sin like they do. You know, you are holy. You are called to be holy. They were yours and you have given them to me. They have kept your word. This is is Jesus talking to God. Okay? They have kept your word. What is God's word? God's word existed long before Jesus was incarnated. You know, approximately 2,000 years ago. God's word existed. So we, as believers, we are supposed to keep his word. Keep the eternal word of God. I say eternal because it is eternal. The same rules, the same regulations, the same word, the same doctrine that God gave to Enoch, 
Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses is the same word we are to keep. Verse 7, now they have known that all things, whatever you have given me, are from you. For the words which you have given me, I have given to them. Again, how many times did Jesus have to say this? He said it over and over and over again. The words that he spoke was not his words. It was God's words. Okay? It was his father's words. It, it was the words of the Torah. It was the words of the Tanakh. It was the words of the law of God, the instructions of God. It was the words of Scripture that was written by the hands of Moses and David, Enoch, Isaiah, Job. These are the words that Jesus is talking about. Again, verse 8, For the words which you have given me, I have given to them. They received them and knew for sure that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I am. <laughs> this, what? this is awesome. This is awesome because... Jesus made it very clear. I'm not praying for everybody. I'm only praying for a specific group of people here. Again, this just is just so contrary to the fake golden calf Jesus that's, that is set up in so many of the churches today, in so many of the minds of the people today, that, that Jesus is, is just this all-loving, hyper-nice kind of goody-two-shoe guy that would just pray for everybody. He prays for everybody. He would just walk down the streets of, of Los Angeles or New York or, you know, any of these big cities around the world and just pray for everybody as he goes. Just love them all. That's not what the scriptures say. That's not what Jesus said. I need to emphasize this because so many people, has they've got their Jesus wrong. <laughs> they've got their Jesus wrong. They've got a totally different Jesus than what we have in the Bible, okay? Their Jesus is some imaginary Santa Claus kind of figure. I'm talking, I mean, let's go with the truth. Do you want the truth or do you want a convenient, comfortable lie? Do you want a nice little pretty lie that makes you feel good or do you want the truth? I want the truth. Let's read this again. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. I don't pray for the world, he says. I don't pray for the world. I pray for them. This specific group of people, God, that you've given me. This specific group of people, Father, that you've given me. Out of the world. These holy ones. The ones that are set apart from the world. The ones that don't think, live, behave, look like the world. They're a peculiar people. A lot of people today that wear the name of Christian, they're not very peculiar at all. They look like the world. They get tattoos like the world. They color their hair like the world. They cut their hair like the world. They listen to worldly music. They listen to worldly TV. They hang around with worldly people. These, This is wrong. I mean... If you are part of the real chosen people of God, if you if you are part of the true ecclesia, church, the, in the original Greek manuscripts, for those of you who don't, don't know, whenever you see the word church, it's usually, if not always, translated from the Greek manuscript word ecclesia. And that word means called out ones. You are called out. That word in and of itself talks about holiness. Today, we got so many people, <laughs> so many groups and clubs that wear the name church, but they're certainly not called out from the world. They join right in with the world. They jump right in with the world's activities. Shame on them. Shame on them. Verse 10, all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Can you imagine? 
praying like this, looking up to heaven and, and talking to the Father and saying, everything that I have is yours and everything that you have is mine. Wow, what an awesome prayer. Verse 11, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. This is a prayer of preservation, okay? Jesus is praying that, that, that his believers are preserved. Keep them through the power of your name. So they may be one as we are one. There we go. We got Jesus and the Father. Two different persons being one. Jesus said, as we are one, Father. Father, as we are one. Think about this. This is Jesus speaking. I pray that the believers, the people you have given me, my people, are one. How can we have thousands, maybe millions of people all one? How can they be one? They're separate persons, but they're one. That means that they are in complete harmony with one another. They think alike. They behave alike. I don't know if any of you actually know how guinea fowl are like. They like to go around in groups. They don't like to be separated at all. They go around in groups, guinea fowl. If you got like five guinea fowl, they'll all stick together usually. Ten guinea fowl, they'll usually, they all want to stick together. You know, if one goes over here, they'll all go over there. If another one goes over here, they all go over there. Okay? They're all one, but they're, they're separated, but they're one. They're like, a, they're like one body. And that's what it's like with Jesus and the Father. Wherever the Father goes, Jesus goes. Okay, and so that's the way it's like with the with the believers. We need to be, and this is what Jesus is praying that the believe that His people, His chosen people, are one. We all stick together. We all think alike. We do not separate. Okay, we don't go off and do our own little thing. This is the, this is the difference between sheep and goats. Jesus said the goats go to hell and the sheep go to heaven. Sheep are more community-minded. They stick together. Whereas goats, they're more independent. That's the big difference between sheep and goats. He wants us to be community-minded. Now I'm talking about the specific people that are called out to be holy. Separate from the world system. You don't sin like the world. You don't think like the world. You are separate from the world. These kind of people need to be one, one, even as Jesus and the Father are one. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. That's a powerful thing right there. I have kept those whom you have given me. None of them is lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Who's he talking about? I know a lot of you know. He's talking about Judas. Judah. Yehuda. Iscariot, that is. Verse 13. But now I come to you. Jesus speaking to the Father, remember. And I say these things in the world that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. The world is hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. That's what's going to happen. If you are truly Jesus' disciple, if you are truly a disciple of Jesus, a believer in Jesus, the world hates you. If the world loves you, you are not part of the crowd. You're not part of the, the. You're not part of Jesus' people. You see these celebrities on TV, and some of these celebrities may sing a little gospel songs here and there, sing a little things here and there. Are they really 
Jesus disciple? If they are, the world would hate them. If the world loves them, if everybody loves them, beware. Big red flag. Okay? Beware. Verse 15, I pray not that you would take them from the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. Very interesting. Very, very interesting here. Jesus did not want, Jesus does not want us to be out. I mean, how many of us, you know, you know, they, oh, that we would be taken out of this world, this evil, corrupt world that we're, you know, we're, we're living in amongst these evil people that just vex us. And unfortunately, a lot of these evil people get into government as well. Vex us. Vex us. That's why you should, you know, in all of your power, by the way, this is just a little rabbit trail. I, understand, I know this, but Christian, believer, if you are living in a country where you can go vote and vote for the lesser of the evils, I believe it's your duty to do so. Vote for the ones who are not standing up for sexual immorality. Vote for the ones who are not standing up for the murder of human beings before they're born. Those two things is what God really hates. This is what the scripture says. This is what the Bible says. The same Bible that's in every court. God wants you to put people in power, if it's in your power to do so. People that are the most righteous. I know that there's, <laughs> there are people that are, you got your good, your bad, and your ugly. Actually, in, in politics, at, at least at this point in time, a lot of it's like more like you got your ugly, You've got your really, really ugly, and you've got your t terribly ugly, okay? So vote for the ugly and not the terribly ugly, okay, in this regard. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Wow, this is awesome because we're just talking about this, right? Do you want a comfortable, good-feeling lie? Or do you want the truth? Do you want a few butterflies in your stomach? And do you want to have a smile on your face believing a lie? Or do you want the truth? Do you want to be deceived just for the sake of feeling good? Or do you want the truth? Jesus said, sanctify them. In other words, make them holy. Bring them out of the world. Clean them up. Take the sin out of their lives by the truth as jesus said before you should know the truth and the truth will make you free free from what free from god god forbid free from sin if you know the truth you will be free from sin if you walk out of that church if you're going to church and you keep on walking out of those doors and you still have sin in your life you're not hearing the truth you're not being free from sin because you're not hearing the truth or at least you're not believing it if you're hearing it most likely you're not hearing it your word is truth this is found in psalm 119 verse 142 as you sent me into the world even so i have sent them into the world for their sakes i sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth isn't this interesting that Jesus sanctifies himself, not for himself. Think about this. Jesus sanctifies himself, not for himself, but for you. To be a good example for you. To be an example to follow. In the same way, you should sanctify yourself so that other people would look at you and you would be a very good example for them. Verse 20, not for these only do I pray, but for those also who will believe in me through their word. That means us. That means us. Hallelujah. That's good. That's great news. That means us. Right now, 
we are having the privilege of reading the prayer of Jesus when Jesus actually prayed for us. Hallelujah. Let me read this again because this is so awesome. Not for these only do I pray, these being the, the 12 disciples, or should I, should I say the 11 disciples, but for those also who will believe in me through their word. That's us. We read the words of John. We read the words of Peter. We read the words of the disciples, and we believe Jesus Right now, we are reading the prayer that Jesus prayed personally for us. Isn't that awesome? Verse 21, that they may all be one. Here we go again. Jesus praying that, they, that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one. I tell you, that is awesome. Okay, you got a few people, like Jesus said, if two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You can be with two or three people. There can be, or actually, you can be with one other person or two other people and be one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. Powerful, powerful word from here. This is awesome. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, this is the, this is the sad news here. There are reportedly over 40,000 groups that label themselves the church. Okay? 40,000 denominations all divided can you how can you be even more divided than that i don't know jesus said that it's his will and he's praying that all of his people are one maybe that's the reason why he prayed this because he saw into the future he saw how division can come so easily so quickly don't divide too quickly I mean, you need to, a lot of you people, you need to get out from underneath bad teaching. Yes, you do. Uh, if, if your so-called pastor, actually, we only have one pastor, that's Jesus. But if your so-called pastor uh, is influencing you, and I guarantee you, if he's standing there up in the pulpit every Sunday and you attend church, he is influencing you. If he's not preaching the scriptures here, the way it really is, get out. You need to get out, Okay. Jesus, and this is the thing, right? We got 40,000 some odd denominations, so they say. Now, these are organized groups of organized religion, okay? This is, Jesus, we got to remember, Jesus is not talking about organized, you know, legalized, filed with the government, you know, with, uh, you know, being a charitable organization, filed with the government. He's talking about simply his people. He's not talking about some structured thing, some organized structure of club, whatever you want to call denominations today. They're just organized, more like little clubs with their own little rules and all this kind of, with their own little programs. Jesus is not talking about that. He's talking about his real disciples, his people that are called out from the world, holy, separated separate, set apart, sanctified, that they would be one, that the world would know and believe, Jesus said, that God sent Jesus. So you want the world to believe in Jesus? You got to be one. You got to be one. It's got to be unity. Unity in the right way, that is. There's so many so-called united churches and they're all unified in the wrong way they're unified for evil they're not unified for the scriptures and for holiness and for sinlessness as jesus taught verse 22 the glory which you have given me i have given them that they may be one even as we are one there he goes again he's talking about being unified in unity oneness I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them 
even as you loved me. Here we go. Jesus said, Father, do this so that the world, so that all of these people will know that you have loved my people, my disciples. That obviously means that God doesn't love the world. I know a lot of you would say, well, yeah, God loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and God is love and all this kind of stuff. Read it in context. Don't cherry pick that scripture out of nowhere because you got to read the whole thing. We're, we're in the same book. We're in the same book as John three sixteen. Okay. Jesus said to his father, praying, father, glorify them. Father, may they be one with us so that the world knows that you have loved them. It doesn't say, Father, that the world knows that God loves everybody. That's not what Jesus said. If you want to know what the real John 3.16, what it really means, I mean, go back to when I my other teaching on John 3.16, okay? You know, but in a nutshell, it's a generic statement. You got to ask the question, if you're really honest with yourself, Jesus said very clearly here, he does not pray for the world. He makes it very clear. I'm not praying for the world. I'm only praying for those special people, Father, you're giving me. And that you are going to give me in the future. Only for these, this select group of people. The elect ones. Okay? I'm not praying for the world, he says. Now, if Jesus loved the world... Wouldn't he pray for them? If Jesus loved the world, wouldn't he pray for them? Of course. Jesus said again in John chapter 7, verse 7, the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. The world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. Here he says, I don't pray for the world. Very clearly. I'm not praying for the world. No way. I'm not praying for the world. Father, I'm, I'm praying only for those that you've given me. Only this select little group of people that I have in front of me right now, my 12, 11 disciples, and, for, and those who will believe through their word in the future. The holy ones, the sanctified ones, the ones that are set apart. I don't pray for the world. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me will be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. What a very, very comforting and awesome thing right there. I'm telling you, Jesus prays that his people will be with him and they will see his glory. Verse 25, righteous father, the world hasn't known you, but I knew you. And these knew that you sent me. I made known to them your name and will make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Here again, you see, Jesus prayed very specifically to the father that the love that the Father had for His only begotten Son would be the love that His people would know. The elect ones. The ones that are called out from the world. The ones that are predestined to be His. Now that very, very clearly implies that there are a lot of people who are not recipients of that love. There are a lot of people who will not get that love. That is not part of the deal. It's just not part of the deal. Very, very clear. So isn't this awesome? We have such a wonderful privilege to read the words, the ancient words that, have pre that has been preserved for us thousands of years. And we can read the words of Yeshua HaMashiach the words of Jesus Christ himself in prayer. What a very, very awesome, what a very marvelous privilege we have to read his words 
the words that he prayed, as you go and seek his face, may he reveal his face to you.